Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And I am joined today by Stephen Erickson as we talk about writing again. Hello, Steve. Hi, how are you? I am doing very well. So we we were just discussing like what we could do. And we were thinking a topic to talk about would be exposition and dialogue. The mm-hmm. two major forms of writing that you find in a novel. But it, these these are actually quite big. If you think if we're, we're talking about all of the writing that you find in a novel. So why don't we start by discussing dialogue? Uh, because there's some technical aspects to it. And then we can move on into the exceptions to it and ways that you can play with it and mm-hmm. the different effects that you can achieve. And then if we have time, we will uh, talk about exposition. But if we don't have time, maybe we could do that another day. Sure. I mean, but, you know, in, in, in the act of describing exposition, you you and me here on this video being recorded are actually engaged in dialogue. So you can see how quickly these two things just blend into each other. Yeah. And, and I suppose while we, we talk about them as two different things, two distinct things in their sort of purest form, yeah, they are distinct. Dialogue is when you have characters speaking to other characters, but then you have, well, what about telepathy? which isn't speech, but it's speaking in some form. Or you have internal monologue, which isn't communicating with anyone else, but it's not technically exposition in the same way, but it's used sometimes for exposition. That it's not that there are only two types of writing. These are just the big general pockets that we, we put the writing into. That you have general, when we talk about general rules, and of course, as we've said before, they are rules because they're outlining um, a specific effect that you get from it. And understanding how to do that and how to achieve that effect means that you get to break it knowing what the change to effect will be. Um, so it's not that anyone ever has to write any one way. It's just, here's a whole lot of things that hundreds of thousands of authors have discovered before us and have used before us. So let's stand on the shoulders of giants and learn their lessons and use them and and the readers of course participate in this too because they are um implicitly accepting those rules and that leads to an expectation that those rules will be will be adhered to within a text and of course experimental writers will break those rules for that effect in order to dislodge um the uh, complacency of the reader I have to admit, I remember when we were studying some of the experimental writing, particularly with the the modernist and postmodernist science fiction writers. And you could see that they'd set themselves like some sort of bizarre challenge and mm-hmm. went, right, I am now going to try and write this story as a story, but without plot, without story, without character, without and see what they could strip away just for it still to have meaning yeah. and yeah. to actually play with the very boundaries of what we assume are things that you must have. And they went, yeah. no, you uh, don't actually need those if you do this. Yeah. And I mean, there's a classic Zelazny story that goes uh, temporally in reverse. The entire story is reversed. Um, and if it were just that, it would be just sort of a shrug, you know, having read, okay, that was an interesting experiment. And I never have to read it again or whatever. Um, but it's, it's intimately tied with the, with the theme of the particular story. And, um, then it re it becomes very effective at that point. It's not probably something I would reread, you know, many times. Um, but it was a very interesting experiment and you could see he was, he was messing around with some things there. Yeah. And, you know, Martin Amos did it with, with Time's Arrow, uh, changing narrative time in order to explicitly challenge reading assumptions about mm. character, about how we perceive character, uh, how we perceive the world. Uh, what I find fascinating about so much of the, when people talk about the rules of writing, we need them to understand general principles, mm-hmm. but they're not rules in the same way as say a law. That yeah. it's, if you're, if your narrative needs to break that rule for a particular reason then your narrative needs to break that rule just be aware that 
readers expect that rule to be followed. And when you break it, you're trying to gauge what effect it has on a reader. Yeah. And yeah. or if if you're explicitly playing with how someone is going to perceive this, mm -hmm. that all of these things are, are very, very, but it's like when someone says that you must write in a certain style. Um, and I, I see this come up with, particularly when we read works from other cultures, other backgrounds, uh, in other time periods. And they go, oh, it, it, was, it was written in the vernacular and that's bad. You know, that's what they said about Chaucer. Mm -hmm. And now we all write in the vernacular. Mm -hmm. and it's, oh, but you need to write in good English. You go, but I want this to come across as representative of a particular culture. So I'm writing idiomatically. Oh, well, you should never do that. Well, apart from when you do it and it works because it's fitting in with the story that you're telling. Oh, you should always write to this structure of introduction, instigating event, rising. You go, Except when you, you don't want to tell that story, when you want to tell a different one. Knowing, knowing what the expectation is, knowing what the rule is, isn't to constrain you as an author or a writer. It's to show you that there's an expectation about it and there's an associated effect. Yeah. And I think which, that's which, the big takeaway. Yeah. Which leads us into dialogue. Because dialogue is where, okay, it's everything within quotes, just, you know, technically. <laughs> um, although there are stylistic changes where people will double dash a dialogue or, or you know, whatever. Um, there's slight alterations and variations on that. And it's culturally specific as well. Um, if you look at a French text of, um, you know, any translation, any French book, you'll see that the layout is very different than it is for, for English. So, but within dialogue, you are, I don't know if this is always the case, but generally you are you are then as the author free to step out of the stylistic conventions of the exposition and uh, adhere more closely to the rhythms and patterns of uh, vocalized speech. Does that make sense? Yeah. So at that point, you're now thinking in terms of diction levels for the character. Um, uh, breath patterns for the character depending on how you know how much action they're they're involved in at the time um character motivation uh, and all these aspects that are uh, built in to that dialogue so that the dialogue is not simply conveying the necessary information in the same way that exposition would but it's carrying multiple loads uh in terms of its purpose and um that's where it becomes a lot more challenging because if you were to think of writing dialogue with the same precise grammatical structure as the exposition that you're writing, um, none of it's going to sound real to anyone uh, reading this. It's, it's not the way people speak. But if you were to be very, very closely tied to how people speak, it would be incomprehensible dribble that would last for page after page after page. Um, so, you know, if you sit in a cafe and you listen to a conversation, which I occasionally do, a uh, table next to me, you'll note repetition and statements are repeated multiple times within a conversation. And if you were to write that, um, it gets pretty boring pretty quickly. You also quite often find circularity in conversation. Yeah. That, so if you're sitting chatting with a friend, that you'll start talking about topic A, you'll then talk about topic B, you'll then talk about topic C, and then you'll go back to topic A because something will have popped into your head. And so there can sometimes be a circularity to conversation. Um, and so also to make it clear, like when we talk about dialogue, it's not just between two people. Dialogue is the spoken word on the page that we're sort of generalizing because, you know, people can monologue. But one of, one of the things that I, uh, I find useful as a way to describe aspects of this to students was if you look at a formal speech, uh, given, say, by a world leader uh, to uh, a televised audience. And it's a, it's a very formal speech. And then quite often in it, there will be, they'll drop into a folksy, more conversational line. So it's not, you know, 
ask what your don't ask what your country can do for you ask what you can do for your country you know you have these big grand formal rhetorical conventions used in a speech and then there'll be a little drop in to make them more folksy more relatable and you can see the change in style the change in register going from mm-hmm. very formal to very informal and of course with these crafted speeches those informalities are not incidental they are not accidental these have been put in very specifically to create that impression and so when we think about dialogue in fiction who the character is and what their purpose in speaking is can have a radical effect on what will seem appropriate for that character to say because if you're having a a professor of of rhetoric is having a conversation with their peers and then an undergraduate comes up with a i have a question and they're then having a conversation with the undergraduate but in a in that academic setting you might have that character speak in a certain way if that same professor of rhetoric is in a romantic restaurant with his, his or her current love interest they may use a different way of speaking so how do you make that consistent like how do you reflect that it is the same character and that the dialogue sounds like something they would say yeah and you would do that because that delivers uh quite explicitly the fact that the character is a dynamic intelligence and so that character is then altering how he she responds to uh, the outside world be it other characters or whatever um in an appropriate fashion to that character and so yes it's not it's not the same you know an adult speaking to a 5 year old is very different from an adult speaking to a 30 year old um so they alter they alter their diction levels they they you know sentence sentence length complexity of thought all the stuff it's it's all it's all brought down to that level um to connect with with the five-year-old child so that's one aspect of how you can basically create uh, a sense of of realism to that character and, and the fact that they are they are protein um and malleable and dynamic um but at the same time i it really pays to listen to conversations i i'm going to as a you know as an instructor or, or to teach writing i would say for young writers or beginning writers just listen in on conversations it's not you know yeah it, it's probably not appropriate but i would say most people have uh implicitly drop their demand for privacy if they're speaking in a public place like a cafe or restaurant anyways and many people when they're in that conversation are actually in performance mode because they're aware that they're being listened to by other people etc let let me interject just a little <laughs> i can see if, you getting ready to if if people are uncomfortable with someone saying eavesdrop on these conversations perhaps an opportunity would arise when you're sitting with a group of your own friends sure and sit back. they you sit back and listen to your friends discuss something man there there is nothing more i mean even john gardner talked about it uh writers at a party are the ones standing in the corners watching <laughs> and listening you know and it's it is it's 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 the nature of the beast in a sense um the you take that step back as an, and become the observer rather than the participant and it's not necessarily a virtue at all times right there are times that it'd be much nicer if you participated but it's just your nature not to so um there's no real sense in, in need i think to fight it if, as a as a writer you're going to do this whether you're conscious of it or not and you're going to pick up all of those things in dialogue that most people won't really be thinking about but you'll pick them up and you'll store them away in your head and uh you'll make use of them uh, i mean we're horrible that way yeah. well we shouldn't be invited anywhere basically well it's it's one of the reasons why i tend to steer clear of describing dialogue in terms of realism i prefer mm-hmm. using the term naturalistic dialogue and the reason for this is obviously 
realism carries with it certain connotations, particularly when you're talking about fantasy and science fiction and a whole load of those things. Naturalistic, you're talking about the way that people naturally speak to one another. And yeah, yeah. I mean, that, but hold on, that's just it. When I'm saying listening to conversations, you're not listening to, you don't give a, you know, you don't know these people, you don't give a crap about, you know, their story or their lives or whatever. You're listening to patterns and you're listening for patterns. You're listening for habitual tics. You're, you're listening for, uh, is this person actually talking to the other person or is their conversation actually all about themselves, to themselves? And these kind of questions, right? So they're just, it, it's, it's almost the craft of the conversation rather than the content of the conversation. So it's a bit like when I let you talk and clearly I'm just waiting for you to stop talking so I can make my point. Precisely. And then once I've made my point, I let you talk again. Precisely. Yeah. <laughs> or occasionally, you know, I interrupt because something occurred to me at that moment. And um, and, and this is all stuff that's, that's you know, grist for the mill. I mean, it, it's what it's what the writer wants to be doing when they're dealing with dialogue or characters. Is that characters will interrupt and you want the timing to be just right for one of them. Um, the one doing the interrupting and possibly not right for the other um, and how subject matter can detract from the original statements and, and lead people off in different directions. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that patterning um, and understanding the flow of conversation is, is one of the great strengths of a uh, good dialogue in fiction is that it feels like an actual conversation. Now, and that, that can be a very weird thing because obviously we don't really know how dragons and elves speak, but we've created, the, hopefully the author has created a, a personality and a concept and an entire background to these things so that there, there are patterns that you pick up on. But I think one of the, the interesting things is, as we said, with naturalistic dialogue, there's a lot of repetition. We go back to points that we've already said, there's circularity to it. It, they are not clear-cut sentences. Sometimes they are rambling. Sometimes they are fragments. Yeah. And if you reproduce that all very authentically on the page, that wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be the greatest reading experience. No. And so this is where we move into the artificiality of dialogue in narrative, which is serving a different purpose than the conversations we have with friends that there is a narrative purpose associated with dialogue. So that is now moving it away from that mimetic, verisimilitudinous uh, recreation of a natural conversation and into something that is more focused on what purpose is this serving? Is it building character? Is it furthering uh, the exposition is it developing elements of narrative events is it filling in backstory is it providing character motiv uh, motivation is it consolidating information for the reader is it a combination of all of the above in various levels and it's to understand that while we keep saying we want realistic dialogue or naturalistic dialogue that is always with the caveat that it's in fiction it is in a narrative and Part of that can mean that it has a very different purpose. Yeah, I mean, most of the the motivations and reasons for people saying what they say will have a a surface level, and then we'll have a multitude of other levels that are underneath that are all subconsciously there. Um, and so, as a writer, you want to be delving into that to some extent and making it concrete um, in a way that uh, directs you in the statements that the character is going to make. So in other words, um, you want to reveal motivation, but you don't want to reveal motivation in a direct fashion, generally. We're just talking normal conversation as opposed to argument or as opposed to um, statement of intent or something along those lines so motivation it's like um it's like one of those um what, what were they called those bullseye lanterns is that what they're called that they have the flash you could just you could flash and then it goes dark it has a little hinge thing with a flap 
right? It just blacks it out. I'm yes. Right. Well, basically what I'm trying to suggest is the motivation should come through in, in tiny flashes as opposed to this bright beam that blinds the reader. Um, and so that's one of the things that you want to be thinking of in, in terms of basically assembling the dialogue. But the weird thing is, once the dialogue is up and flowing between two characters you know well, or three characters, whatever, you don't have to be conscious of any of that stuff because it's all going on. It's all going on. Um, and the caginess of characters, of people uh, in dialogue is, is, you know, it's undeniable in the real world. So why, why, why remove it for fiction? Uh, you want that caginess. And that's, uh, I, I'm going to build on that point in a sec because it ties into what I thought we should maybe move on to, which is some of the purposes that we use dialogue for. Because mm -hmm. obviously a, a general giving a speech to the troops is a form of, well, it's usually a monologue. Yeah. But or the general addressing their staff uh, and the conversation at strategic planning session or that same general then talking to their servants if they have servants or an aide de camp of some kind or to soldiers who are on guard duty that the purpose of the dialogue is going to change the register it's going to change the level of the rhetoric but building on on what you were just saying what were you just saying because i lost my train of thought i i haven't a clue anymore um but i mean the interesting thing is yeah you can convey things like authority um and hierarchy very very quickly through dialogue as you say you know addressing a servant is very different from addressing an equal uh quote unquote um whatever that you know setting you've created uh, establishes that hierarchy so um yeah these are all sort of ways in which dialogue is altered by the circumstances uh, of the story you're creating. Um, and maybe that's the point, is that if you have dialogue with characters in a world, a secondary world that, that's built uh, within sort of the parameters of fantasy, um, do they all sound like your friend down the street? Well, no, they, they're not likely to, at least not effectively anyways. So, um, I, I think it, in many ways, dialogue is one of the greater challenges for the writer, um, but it's also the, the greatest opportunity to really stretch your, your stylistic uh, abilities um, and to take that challenge of altering voice uh, among a multitude of, of characters. Because there was a, one of the, my favorite examples of a lot of this with dialogue is the character that Tim Roth plays in the film Rob Roy. Because Tim Roth plays a foppish uh, noble in and when in the presence of who he perceives as his superiors, who he recognizes as having more authority and power, he is obsequious and this dandy. But as soon as they are out of sight and earshot, he switches his tone, his, his style of speaking, immediately turns and he becomes vicious and uh, much more foully spoken. His voice changes. The words, uh, the register, the language he uses changes. The inflection changes. Everything changes in that moment because what he is doing with his superiors is performance. And then he is asserting his authority to feel big about himself to those who, are, who have less power than him. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's the advantage that, that film and television uh, visual media has over fiction, because it can be very hard to make constant references to the register of a person's voice. You can do it, you can pop it in, you know, you said in a low voice or whatever, uh, low tone um, or in a high tone. But if you do it for like everything, it just it becomes this ridiculous sort of sing song performance. And so the writer has to has to convey that through the words themselves, which is an added challenge um, that the uh, you won't see on on film and television. And and this actually brings us into because I wanted to talk a wee bit about dialogue tags because obviously you could make everything absolutely explicit that you could in dialogue tags he said angrily with a snarl as he gesticulated at and 
you could do that for every line of dialogue. And I think everyone would go, this is exhausting and boring. And yes, I know exactly what is happening on the page, but you're not leaving anything up to my imagination. You're, you're telling me everything that is happening. And I can picture the scene very vividly, but yeah. it becomes boring and exhausting to read. Yeah. And I was, I was really pushed in that direction for Gardens of the Moon. So you'll find more of that in there than you will in any of my other books. I, I, I angle things back to a more comfortable state for me. I think it's more a case or could be a case of the author not having confidence in the intelligence of the reader. So in other words, you're spelling things out far too um, directly and not and not saying, no, this reader is going to pick up the, int the, the intonations of this and, and the tone and all the rest. And of course, you can you can easily falter by going too far with that where there aren't enough tags to to actually give a sense of what's the context of what's just been said. Yeah, and, and that's, I think, where we see the, the two extremes. On the one hand, <clears throat> you can have every single line of dialogue telling you who said it, how they said it, who they said it to, and what they were doing. And you go, I think almost everyone would agree that is far too much information. On the, ex the other extreme, you can, ha you can have none of that ever. And all you have are the lines of dialogue. And you go, that that is maybe too extreme in the other direction. That, that I, that's I would... a much that's a much more popular um, default mode for a lot of uh, contemporary fiction, certainly within America, anyways. It's it's uh, it's the very Hemingway esque uh, approach to things. But you tend to have occasional, at least occasional tags or lines inset that give the reader guidance at certain points where the author feels this has been going on for a while. Maybe I will just give them a bit of a helping hand here. And that's, right. it's always a balance between those extremes. And yeah. But don't forget, don't forget those tags are exposition. Yeah. Yeah. But they are also an integral part sometimes of dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, you know, you, you mentioned at the beginning the different house styles or different um, styles that dialogue can be related, potentially because of culture or because of uh, certain publishing houses. But they have a house mm -hmm. style about, is it single um, inverted commas? Is it the, the double inverted commas? Um, do you close off inverted commas if it's a new paragraph and the person is going to be continuing speaking? Or do you just not close it off and then a uh, new set just to say so, you know it's their whole that's the rule i i was taught for sure yeah but these are different house styles and of course house styles evolve over time and uh, these different concepts evolve over time about what we want and what we don't want um but when it comes to the the tags that go with it i mean one of the things that frequency is never use adjectives adjectives bad no naughty adjectives and you go that's ridiculous well, uh, didn't Stephen King more or less state that he, he hated all those adjectives? But and again, it's you know we we have a tendency to use hyperbola when we talk about these things. Oh, never use them. Well, mm. no, of course you use them, but it's the if you use them all the time to yep. constantly signal to a reader, then you're not trusting your reader. At the no, same time, no. it takes a lot of the pressure off a reader because they don't have to think. So th there's a balance to be struck and it's not that you should never use adjectives or never use adverbs. Um, it's how you use them, what impact you're getting from them because running quickly, quickly is unnecessary there because it's very, very weak in supporting running. They, it's basically describing the same thing, but running sporadically is actually interesting because it's changing what the running is doing, depending on what you're using it for. Um, grinned evilly. You know, that's it's inverting what the grin means. Th there are reasons to use them, but it's not always necessary every single time. Yeah. And like all of these things where, you know, people talk about you need to show and not tell it's, if you become reliant on them and start using them as a crutch, uh, you end up not trusting your reader. Mm -hmm. You then are using them in situations where they are not necessary. And that is adding uh, weight 
not well, adding bulk to your prose that doesn't need to be there. It isn't adding um, anything essential. It is simply yeah. expanding what is already there. But again, this is all exposition, not dialogue. So when I was in, in my undergraduate writing program, and I really learned a lot more in that program than I ever did at Iowa, as an aside. But um, the challenge that was presented to us um, is you want to convey those tags in the dialogue itself. And so that was, that's the thing I sort of found myself having to work a lot at doing. Um, and, you know, to, to, to whatever extent, I, I, you know, I think I, I may have mastered it, but I may rely too much upon uh, implicitly putting the tone of what is said into the words themselves. And if I'm going to add any expositional tag to it, it may be a physical gesture or an expression as opposed to something linked directly to the words themselves. And that was, that's just how it was taught, you know, when I, when, when I was, you know, learning to write short stories, uh, but just learning prose in general, um, is that you really, you've succeeded if you can get the emotional content of the statement of the dialogue within the dialogue itself. If you can get that across to the reader without having to do a tag, then you get a gold star, basically. So I can see, yes, and I've learned over the years that there are times when it's appropriate to actually add that particular little hooking tag at the end of something. Um, but then you quickly discover that if you add that tag and you're writing from a point of view of another character, that tag can be entirely wrong. In other words, the character can read what is just said in the wrong fashion because they didn't pick up the expression or the tone or the gesture or anything else. Maybe they're not looking in that direction or whatever, or they just misread the character. So now you can start messing around with things in terms of those tags, and then they become useful in that respect. You know, if you think you have a character and that character's point of view is attaching tags to what everybody everything everybody says around that character as as a stylistic thing that they're trying to interpret everything around them then it would be an interesting experiment um and, but you'd have to i think keep it exclusive to that character um and it's just i'm just sort of thinking aloud here but yeah yep. it's um but that's, that's what, but that's what we said at the start that it, don't use uh, try not to overuse tags and then you can immediately think well actually <laughs> I could use them, but I could use them for everyone else, not for the point of view. But, and it's understanding that, okay, here's the general rule. Here's why the general rule exists. But now that you know that, how can I play with it? How can I break it? How can I make it do something different? And I think that is the, the absolute joy of writing, is recognizing, like all of these rules that people tell you, but recognizing they're all about creating effects or they're all corresponding to certain expectations. And if you know that, if you, you are aware of it, you can mess with it. But no, probably here's, not. here's an interesting one. That's the first time I've used your name, even though we've been sitting chatting now for quite some time. That's the first time I've used your name in quite some time. Oh, well, you, broke, you, you broke the major rule. I'm supposed to be addressing you, AP Kahneman, every time I speak to you, AP Kahneman. But Steve... Steve, you have to you have to listen to me when I'm talking to you, Steve, because how will people know that we are talking, Steve? And but this this is one of those really weird things about dialogue in books. Like how often have we said, "Oh, I wish they would use the character name more often?" And you, you think about it, we we generally once we're in, if we're only in conversation with one other person, we don't use their name usually because it's well, clear it, we are talking to them yeah. unless we're going no. Stephen, I am very disappointed in you. Nothing new there, but the 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 interesting thing is because I, I I I was in fact the scenes I've just been writing, where you have a character who has a title like a military title, um, I will put those in there, um, to 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 make sure that or basically to convey that the conversation here is an official conversation, 
And I'm not talking to you as a person, I'm talking to you as the adjunct or whatever, right? The captain, whatever. Um, but also it allows for some variation in, in if you're going to name the character, uh, you don't want the character speaking to the other person and constantly naming them like you just did a few minutes, you know, a few seconds ago. Yeah, but, but I, I, I think a great example of this is when you have a, a, a scene with military officers mm -hmm. and you have a general addressing a captain and it's captain, you will stand at attention and then turn it, sergeant, take the captain, blah, 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 blah. And then when the formal sort of aspect of that scene is over and they might turn to the same captain and go, Steve, really sorry about that, but I had to do that because so-and-so was standing over there and they expected me to dress you down. And suddenly it drops it into an informal register. Mm -hmm. And we become aware then of that shift of tone and yeah. uh, meaning behind things. And like, as, I, as we were discussing, sometimes the reason for the dialogue, why that scene is there, can dictate very heavily some of the aspects of the dialogue, the types of words that are being used. So even using someone's name, that isn't natural in conversation a lot of the time. But because this is in fiction, it is a scene in a book, authors thankfully take pity on us and mm -hmm. will add in those things, even though they are not naturally there. Yeah. And also then using titles to A, as variants so that we don't get bored, mm -hmm. but also things like that of dictate of showing formality yeah a level of formality in the conversation and that i think is is one of those tricks that although we keep saying yes i want it to be realistic i want it to be naturalistic well i don't want it to be too realistic or naturalistic i actually still want it to fulfill its purpose within the narrative yeah. and when you have that tension Authors can can err too far one way or too far another. And that sweet spot is not going to be the same for every single reader. No. And that is also something that we as readers have to be very aware of, that this is the style that an author is using. It may not be exactly right for us, but if we can see that they're, they're aiming for that point between highly fictive and in total service of the narrative and very naturalistic if we can see where they're aiming at we go i can see exactly what they're doing it hasn't quite hit the right note for me or the right balance for me but it's in the general ballpark yeah yeah i think often within dialogue you can end up or you can one can end up reading a section where dialogue has basically become a q a session and that can really start getting irritating quick because it really breaks verisimilitude um to a huge extent, because people are people are are can be quite reluctant uh, to provide answers, especially you know um, answers that can lead to litigation or whatever, right? You know, in some fashion or another. So there is a there if there's a natural built-in reluctance to actually answer specific questions, um, you have to acknowledge that in in the work, and so a Q and A session. Unless you know they're being tortured, they're tied to a chair, and there's a bright light on them. Um, even then, they may lie through their teeth. But <laughs> the point being, you don't provide answers easily unless you have a good reason for doing so. But it's the classic. Or you example. want to miss, you miss, you want to, you want to misdirect. Yeah, but it's the classic example of a group of adventurers arrive in a small town that is being ruled by the iron fist of a tyrant who has spies and evil monsters everywhere. And they walk into the tavern and go, aha, tavern keeper, are there any quests? Or the tavern keepers, yeah. ah, there's an evil tyrant who's over overruling this land and has spies everywhere. Could you go and kill them for us? I will I've pay you. I've got my list right here of quests, yes. And I, if we were reading that, we'd go, oh God, this is absolutely terrible. And you go, why is it terrible? Well, if the tavern keeper lives there, and knows there are spies everywhere. They are not going to be very outspoken against the evil tyrant overlord because that will get them killed. Especially so, not to strangers. And the second thing is, these are strangers. These are random people who have just walked mm. in. Who do they work for? What is their background? Can they be trusted? The innkeeper doesn't know. So why would the innkeeper trust them? And 
we can immediately see those things if we if we think about it. But quite often, because a narrative is traditionally in a lot of those stories resting with the quest group, they walk in and they need the information to go on for the next part of the adventure. Mm -hmm. So this is a pay the innkeeper for information. Innkeeper, tell me the local, here's some gold. And the innkeeper, like, like some sort of slot machine, you plug in a couple of coins and out come all of the rumors. There you go. And yeah. it then moves on. And, you know, it, it can be done well, it can be done badly, but we kind of accept it because the focus is somewhere else. Even though as soon as you think about it, you go, that makes no sense. Strider in the Fellowship of the Ring. Ah, yes, I'm sitting in the back of the bar looking strange and sinister with my, my pipe and my uh, hood down Good. over my face. And now I'm just going to walk up to this guy and go, right, Gandalf sent me. Let's go, lads. And they're going to go, oh, OK. That there's an element now with a lot of modern writing that we, we try to bring in an, an element of psychological realism. Yeah. An element, not, not true psychological realism, because then it would become really complicated. But understanding character motivation and understanding that some characters' motivations do not support what you want to do as author with the narrative i think is they they are going to withhold um and to get them to divulge this sort of stuff there has to be a compelling reason yeah um or fade to black and it's lucky that innkeeper got drunk in the corner and let that slip now let's go <laughs> it happened off page you don't have to imagine it yeah but with with dialogue, I mean, one of the things that has always fascinated me with with dialogue is the ability of dialogue to convey who the character is and what the character thinks. Mm -hmm. um, not only their style of language. Uh, so when we were talking about Reds, whether it's very formal or informal, which gives you an idea of what they think of the other people in the conversation, but also then their choice of lexicon, if they are using very martial words, if they're constantly reaching for analogies that have to do with war and warfare and battle, that might be signifying their position as a soldier. If they use different analogies and metaphors and similes in their or idioms and, and imagery in their conversation, you can tie that in to that aspect. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, aggressive words used in dialogue versus passive words used in dialogue conveys a lot of the character and also serves the added purpose of delivering threat um some sense of threat or danger in what a character says so yeah all of these things um which of course we see all the time in, in film and television but uh the reading experience is uh, a unique one so. yeah and and that's why i think it's it's interesting because the other element to it that we get with audio performances or audiovisual performances so film tv and even audiobooks is accent Mm -hmm. An accent is something that obviously some authors use uh, and change the spelling of words so that basically we're, we're sounding them out. We can see the accent on the page. Yeah, I've done it on occasion. I don't do it very often anymore. Um, and, you know, I find it very frustrating because I'm starting with a pronunciation that's going to be different anyway. And so let's say uh, you as a Canadian think that a word or a selection of sounds is going to be spelled out this way and i'll look at that and because my native accent is different i'll sound them out completely differently quite often yeah well you're just a hosiery eh? <laughs> yeah. but and that it ends up actually making it incomprehensible because i can't guess the word from the sounds because i'm not sure how you're trying to do it and, it's and very... that's what I made fun of with Nep Furrow. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like some people use it to very good effect. And sometimes it's nice to use very sparingly uh, because one of the one of the dangers of that is, like for you just used the, the classic Canadian stereotype, hoser and mm. A. But if you had a Canadian character and they were constantly saying that, that would be, bad face palm bad so if you have mm -hmm. a country bumpkin character who is constantly using the same phrase or expression time and time again it becomes repetitive mm -hmm. and you might 
you as author might think, well, this is, it makes them sound authentic. I've heard people say this. You go, but look at the number of lines of dialogue that they have. How many times have they said that? Is that going to be representative? So it's, there's always, I th and again, it's a tension between these things. How much do you want to dictate in terms of accent and how much do you want to leave to the reader's imagination? Yeah, and I keep, I'm increasingly defaulting towards the latter. Um, I don't want to dictate too much. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll do it in, in terms of lazy speech, right? Where they're dropping, they're dropping the last, you know, little bit of the syllable or whatever. Um, but yeah, generally these days, um, you know, I had my fun with Nep for a while as, as a character. So I think I'm, whatever point I was trying to make, I made it with that one. So, and I mean, like, great example of all of this sort of stuff is um pygmalion uh george bernard shaw and uh henry higgins and eliza doolittle mm -hmm. and looking at how you know one the the rain in spain falls mainly on the plane mm -hmm. um and all of these sort of elocution lessons about you know do you drop drop an itch um or not drop an itch and playing playing with that because of the perception of intelligence and education associated with speech. And that is something fascinating. Like if you have someone who is a character who is a um, genius physicist and you give them a slow Alabama drawl, it challenges the expectation that a lot of people have about that stereotypical yeah. Alabama. Harvard, Harvard trained MITs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it's amazing. Like we think, oh no, but we'd we'd never do that. But it's it's so ingrained oh. because it's represented so many times in popular culture, um, certain cultural attitudes or uh, levels of education or um, speed of thinking. Someone who talks quickly must think quickly. You're like, nope, nope. Someone who speaks slowly must think slowly. Nope, no. Nope. Uh, and being aware of that, again, can be something absolutely brilliant. And that's, I think that can be very difficult for readers to get their heads around uh, the first few times that they see it, that we do have a lot of assumptions about accent and the stereotypes that play yeah. in. Yeah. And of course, all of those should be tossed away as soon as you've stepped into a secondary world anyways, but it's not because that, that class consciousness is still going to be there. And depending on what culture you're from, the, the form of class consciousness will, will be different. Yep. And also depending on what an author has chosen inspiration from or has replicated from our world or only changed part of or has accepted, that all of these things can play into it. And that, that unconscious set of biases can make us read dialogue in very different ways. Um, and it, it's a fascinating aspect of it because it's very revealing about us as reader. Um, quite often more so than it is about the author. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in many ways, I guess dialogue is the one that, that's most most readily uh, dated. Um, as opposed to say expositional style, because people can mess around with expositional style and write a Victorian novel in, in the present day if they wanted to. Dialogue, because there's an the idiosyncratic element to it, um, it can date itself very quickly. And that may be something we're all going to be discovering, or or at least our our descendants will be discovering when they when they look over our, our works. But even even going back uh 100 100 or so years the use of contractions even mm -hmm. in dialogue yeah. the use of contractions just wasn't there i must not do that he, yeah which which has become yeah it's become the shorthand for creating a medieval setting <laughs> to actually take away the contractions um and yet if if we have if you have a, a modern day set where someone you must not you cannot that would suddenly put them in a very formal, uh, almost like prissy or um, 
the characterization that goes with that is very different to you can't do that you mustn't do that you shouldn't that that seems much more natural and that's because it's it's closer to how we speak conversationally i would say there's a hierarchy implied there the must not is the authority you, you shouldn't is the more equal level right and, yeah and those are other things that you can play with as well and that's that's why word choice Mm -hmm. It's so, so important. And where and, yeah. uh, and this is, you know, it's something I talk to students about all the time. Just using a synonym doesn't always work because synonyms, A, don't always function the way that you think they do and they won't necessarily fit with what you're doing. But also B, might have a very different connotation and actually change something quite radically. Yeah, uh, grumping through the garden, for example, I think would, would not work, would it? Well, I mean, is that word even used anymore? Who knows? Um, but it's like even yomp. Yomp was a very particular term uh, for the, was it the English forces going through the Falklands? They talked about yomping uh, really? as, a, as a style of movement, uh, a sort of forced march. Kind yeah. Of. But that was that was very very particular. But if you use it now, because it's so far removed from that context, you can convey that it's a form of movement, and then all you're left is with the, that sort of the sound of it, yomping. Like, oh, I wonder what that. It it seems like a strange form of movement. Oh, on. okay, yeah, no, that's a really that's an interesting. It invites an interesting um, topic, which is within the the setting and the story you've created, you're going to have subcultures. Those subcultures are going to have their own lexicon. And so, you know, I'm thinking in terms of say, yomping would be very well understood within that close knit military unit and, and the, the, the culture and society that surrounds it. Um, humping would be the other one when, when you're picking up a backpack and going right uh, in the military. So if you can be a bear in mind that you can create a lexicon specific to the soldier group or the mercenary group or whatever, the military group that you have in your story. Then when they speak with each other, they understand each other fully. It doesn't mean somebody outside that will understand what they're talking about, but they will. So then there's that second level of, of meaning, which is exclusive and specific to those particular characters and the roles that they play in the story. Yeah. Um... Yeah. I, I was recently watching, uh, rewatching the film Heat um, from the from the nineties, and there's that scene where you have Al Pacino and Robert De Niro discussing things. They they meet for a coffee and they're on the opposite side. One the the thief, one the, the cop, and you know he talks about when you feel the heat on you, and obviously he's referring to the police. Mm -hmm. And then you think of um, the the film with Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, uh, Hot Fuzz, The Fuzz. Think of all of the different terms used for various police forces and used in different contexts by different cultures uh, in different countries. But there are all of these different terms for the police. Mm. And sometimes when, when you're reading a fantasy novel, there seems to be one term for something and only mm -hmm. one term. Mm -hmm. And you go, but why, why is everyone in the entire world all agreeing this one term when even within our own society we have multiple terms for the same thing and but it's a lot more work for the writer it's a lot more work yeah but you chose to be a writer not my fault <laughs> i don't mind i mean i you know i, I studied anthropology that's all that's what it's all about right um so no i don't mind it um but it is a lot of work but that's because not only that you have to do translation within within your own text so that you get a point of view character who doesn't understand what that soldier was talking about and then the soldier you have that character say well what do you mean by that and then the soldier turns around and explains it to you the audience the reader as well as the character so there's more work involved yeah and yeah. but that's why it's and again you don't have to go overboard with it i think all of these things are always about knowing when you can use them and, and yeah, when yeah. maybe it, it's over salting the meal, so to speak. But green skins, orcs, um, they, you know, having different terms for them, mm -hmm. even only two terms for them allows for that, that change. Mm -hmm. And that I think is, is one of those things that adds a little tiny extra depth 
and feeling of immersion to the world yeah. instead of all of them always just referring to them as orcs of the genus orci <laughs> yeah well and, and it's weird because i i find that you know if i'm writing like i'm doing now i'm about to open up a new chapter with uh where i'm following the marines um i just fall into their their idiomatic patterns almost immediately and it's really comfortable to be there and um and then i finish that chapter and i have to pull myself you know bodily back out of that and alter the sentence structure alter everything else because i'm no longer in that really cohesive um, mindset that is is uh, the military and so you know it almost it it demands a kind of stylistic change if you're if you're really being close on point of view to to your characters then you you have to make that that, that complete shift um, of mindset into into the next set and that really ties back into like some of the things that we were talking about in terms of first second and third person narration that depending on your perspective on it um like first person it dialogue will always be filtered by that character who is the point of view yeah. whereas in third person you you have options you have different tools you can be very close to a character point of view or you can be more omniscient you can be more uh more detached and further back you can provide more information about both parties in the conversation yeah. um and so you can see how like dialogue we've already talked about how dialogue can be shaped by who the character is by what the character is doing in a scene their motivation um who's perceiving it's always shaped by that those things always there's and, no other way around it and the point of view character the point of view of the narration is is going to be directly related to this and so it's i know we try to separate these things out to try and talk about one particular topic but they are integrated they are Completely. always always affecting each other yeah yeah so i mean a lot of this you know we're talking actually relates to psychic distance but that's a whole different subject right there right and we haven't even got to internal monologue we, we haven't gotten the internal monologue or expositions maybe we'll do those in a different video this one has just been about you know the, a conversation about dialogue <laughs> dialoguing about dialogue oh dear yeah uh, i did try i did avoid that i thought of it when a dialogue about dialogue no no come go for conversation but it's still bad anyway <laughs> thank Expositing you expositing about dialogue <sighs> conversationally expositing about dialogue thanks steve you're welcome i i'm good with titles <laughs> and for those of you still watching and enjoying my suffering Thank you for watching. Thank you for your continued support and we will see you in the next one.